Okay, maybe we should get started. So, hello everybody. Welcome, welcome. Kroiso Ibaub. Uh, my name is Dalan Pugh and welcome to this event. This is all about the world of podcasts. Very exciting indeed. Uh, we've got a stellar lineup of people to talk tonight. Um, but this is all part of Wales Tech Week. We've just heard that there's 97 events on during Wales Tech Week. So we're very thankful of them for putting on such an amazing week of uh, of good quality content and uh, showcasing the amount of talent that's in Wales. So thank you to those guys. We did have a flashy video to share, but the technology failed us and the sound didn't work. So maybe if we get that to be fixed, we can share that with you at the end. Um, but as you can see, this is a Global Welsh Academy event too. So um, big thanks to Global Welsh. If you're not too familiar with the work of Global Welsh, so it's a grassroots not-for-profit organization focused on connecting Wales with diaspora around the world. Um, they've created a huge global community of professionals with an, all with an affinity to Wales um, to facilitate warm connections, new opportunities, and enable sharing of knowledge and insight. Um, and for me personally, I've had a huge amount of benefit from a professional capacity from being part of the Glo Global Welsh events. So um, I would highly recommend you go to the connect.globalwelsh.com to get involved in those. Um, they also have an investor portal as well. So if you're a, a startup or you're an investor looking to invest, um, then they connect Welsh startups to Welsh investors outside of Wales. So please get involved with them. Um, the obligatory housekeeping before we get started. So I'm sure you've all been through these multiple times over the last couple of months. Um, death by Zoom calls. But please keep on mute if you are not talking. Um, please, uh, it's best if you use the speaker view if you want to see some of the slides as well as some of our pretty faces and my pretty castle in the background if you want to. Um, if you've got any comments or questions, please add them in the chat functionality within the Zoom chat. Uh, there will be questions at the end, so uh, hopefully we'll get through all of your comments and questions. Um, we are recording this session as well, so hopefully you're all okay with that. Um, and if you need to go to the bathroom, then just hold your hand up and please ask politely. No, joking. Um, and uh, if anybody wants to take a, a guess at what my background picture is, it's a, a Welsh landmark that I thought I would brighten up the day with so feel free to throw some guesses in on the chat and there'll be a special prize to some at the end there's no special prize anyway we will get going and on with the content so like i said we have an absolute stellar group of guests uh, absolute superstars from the podcasting world who are all hailing from wales so we've got steve austins from bengal media reese waters from podstarter sarah and jones from bbc and Steph Guerrero from Natter Media, who's behind one of the big hits of, uh, of the summer in the podcasting world, the Socially Distanced Sports Bar. So looking forward to speaking to all of those. Um, before we start off the Q&A with those guys, I'm going to give a bit of a background to the podcast landscape. So for those of you who already work in the podcast world, maybe this is a bit of a, a, an easy sort of dummies guide for you, but um, you never know who's on the call. So hopefully some people can learn from some of this. But um, I'm just going to quickly cover off some of the, the background to the podcast marketplace. So yeah, um, my name is Dylan Pugh. I'm currently the head of podcast monetization for EMEA at Spotify, although that will be changing soon. I'm actually uh, jumping ship to set up my own business. So I'm starting a podcast business naturally myself. So uh, I'm sure you'll all hear more of that over the next few weeks, which I'm very excited about. Um, but I'm just going to share with you a little bit first on sort of some of the Spotify plans, if you're interested, and some of the marketplace. So where better to start than a graph with some numbers? So um, just in terms of to give you an, a, a taste of the amount of people who are listening to podcasts here in the UK. So in the UK and the US, about a third of the population are listening to podcasts monthly. You go to places like Germany and that increases to almost half the population. So you can see how advanced they are as a market. Um, but here, around a third um, of the population listen to podcasts on a monthly basis. And you can see the rate of growth through that as well. And I'm pretty sure that 2020 will be a lot higher. And um, we as a company, um, as you would have seen with all of our investments in, in this space, are very bullish on the growth of podcasts. Um, and there's a couple of macro trends that we often speak about as to you know, why we think this is such a, an interesting area for us. Um, the main macro trend for us is that anything linear and bro all linear and broadcast content is going to decline and any anything on demand is going to increase now that is a trend that's already happened uh, very fast in, in the video and tv space where 
you know, younger people are not watching TV as much anymore or cutting the cord as our friends in America like to call it. Um, and services like, you know, BBC iPlayer, YouTube, Netflix, Amazon Prime, et cetera, are really growing in popularity. Um, whilst that trend has happened in the audio space with services like Spotify and, and Apple Music and Amazon, um, it hasn't happened to quite the same extent. But actually, if you look on the graph or, or the numbers on the right hand side, it's quite interesting to see the average age demographic profile of podcast listeners versus radio listeners. It's essentially the mirror opposite of each other. Um, and if you just imagine over the next 10 years, I could have thought that the podcast numbers are probably going to be a lot more evenly distributed, whereas the radio numbers are probably going to be a lot sharper curve up to the right, whereby the older age groups are going to be a lot more heavily represented. So um, that is a clear shift that is going to happen. And it's an interesting world to be in if you're working in the podcast space at the moment. A couple of other trends that we think will accelerate this. Firstly, is the world becoming more connected. So two things, as the car becomes a lot more connected and the home becomes a lot more connected with, you know, voice activated devices and other connected TVs and games consoles and things. Um, on-demand audio is just going to become a lot more accessible and easy to listen to so that will grow podcasts a little bit more and the second uh, macro trend is and i'm sure you can all align with this that people are generally trying to reduce the amount of screen time that they have on a daily basis and um, i can certainly uh, align with this myself you know I, i'm quite embarrassed to say that i'm probably quite addicted to my phone and i'm sure there's many people on this call who would probably say the same um, so, you know, I'm consciously trying to not use my phone as much, especially when my kids are around and I see them getting addicted and they're only probably six and eight. Um, so, you know, if, from a podcast perspective, the fact that people can still consume good quality content and be entertained by something, but not have a bloody phone in front of their eyes, that is a really a good thing for podcasts uh, uh, to, to add value to people. Um, so there's that. Then looking into the platforms that people are using to listen to podcasts. Again, this might be a bit obvious to some people that Apple is a dominant platform here in the UK and in many markets. Um, iTunes before, but it's now Apple Podcasts. Um, but it's interesting to see, you know, putting my Spotify hat on here, the numbers on the right hand side to see how we are fast catching up. It's interesting in the space of 12 months to see this, the spread of um, Spotify versus Apple and the share that we are growing on them. Um, but in the UK, you know, BBC Sounds is a huge, huge resource. BBC creates some amazing, uh, good quality audio content. It's great that Siren is, is here to, to chat to us later on. And also YouTube as well is a massive podcast listening platform. Personally, I don't quite understand why people listen to podcasts on YouTube, but many people do. So good for them. The kind of content that people are listening to. So generally, the most popular genres are things like fiction, true crime, sports, comedy, lifestyle, news and business has been a fast growing one recently. But an interesting trend in the UK is that most of the most listened to podcasts and these charts from Spotify and Apple podcasts are a couple of months old by now. So not totally accurate as of today. But it's interesting that the, most of the podcasts that people listen to in the UK are from famous, well-known celebrities. So you look at the BBC ones, you've got Louis Theroux, Chris Ramsey, Sandy Toxvig, Joe Rogan, uh, Rob Beckett, uh, Peter Crouch, Fern Cotton, Robbie Williams, Catherine Ryan, etc. So it tends to be quite dominated by the celebrity world in the UK. That isn't quite necessarily the case in other markets. So that's quite an interesting trend that's uh, specific to here. Um, and then we as a company, uh, we often talk about this in our narrative, and there's three key reasons why people are listening. Um, the first thing is purely for entertainment. So whether that's true crime, fiction, or sort of, you know, comedy entertainment shows, or for companionship, a lot of the podcasts are kind of chat show style. So, you know, the host is the main draw and the users and the listeners feel some kind of relationship and companionship with that host and their guests. Um, then the third area is for education. So whether it's you know, science or news or business, you know, shows like TED Talks are very popular. Um, and, uh, and this is an area which has seen the most growth in the last few months, uh, mainly due to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, which brings me on to this, where a couple of trends that we've seen as a company at Spotify recently, where you can see on the left hand side, the growth of streams on platform. This is just streams on Spotify. Um, you can see that is quite a steep trend in the last 12 months anyway but actually we saw a bit of a dip when we first went into lockdown 
this is when we lost the commuting as the key moment. So commute was the number one moment for people listening to podcasts. So we saw a massive dip initially, which was quite worrying to begin with. Um, but it's interesting to see the comeback. You know, it took people a good few weeks to familiarize themselves with a new routine. And, you know, as you can see, we've recovered from that. And there's more people listening than ever has been before, which is fantastic. Um, and also more people creating as well. So we've seen a 69% increase in the amount of podcasts being created and, and uploaded via Anchor. I know, Steve, you uh, shared uh, a stat on social media recently um, that showed similar kind of numbers. Um, so, you know, it's a good place to be a podcast at the moment. There's more being created, more people listening. Um, there's people listening in different environments, in different contexts. They're listening to different kinds of shows. So sports had a bit of a drop off due to no live sports, but it's been a bit of a comeback now. And the other interesting trend that we've seen is that uh, people are beginning to create shorter form content. I think, again, the commute has affected the amount of time that people have to listen. So we've seen a bit of a drop off in the retention rates. And we've seen people start to optimize towards that and creating shorter form content, which is uh, quite interesting to see. And, uh, you know, from our perspective, we've seen good growth recently. But when the commute returns, whenever the world returns back to normal, that's only going to accelerate yet again. From a Spotify perspective, don't worry, I'm not going to go into full pitch mode here. But, you know, as... We've been on a bit of a shopping spree recently and, uh, you know, been probably the main news in the podcast world over the last 18 months or so. I just wanted to give you a bit of an insight into the Spotify plans. So our goal is to create a podcast platform that caters for all constituents within the ecosystem. Um, so people are familiar with Spotify as a music streaming service. Uh, our goal is to create the first big global audio network, uh, of which podcast is, is the first area of that. So we have a listening experience that people are familiar with from a music experience, but really our main goal here is to take a lot of the engines and algorithms that have powered a lot of the discovery and personalization on the music side of the business. So if you've used Spotify, you've got features like Discover Weekly and Release Radar. So, you know, we've generally been regarded as the best streaming service because of our capabilities in discovery and personalization. So if we can start to apply the same algorithms into the podcast space, and I think that could be a game changer both for listeners and for the entire podcast industry. So there's a lot of investment going on on the back end and on the, engine, on the engineering side to make sure that we're replicating the same experience that we have done for music into the podcast space. Um, from a creative perspective, we've made some acquisitions in Soundtrap and some of you may be familiar with Anchor, which is the hosting platform that's probably the easiest to market. It's, a, it's free as well. It's certainly not the most sophisticated, but at least it's the for anybody wanting to create a podcast, it is quite easy to do. Um, and then from a content side of things, again, we've made a lot of acquisitions here, whether it's big studios like Gimlet, The Ringer, Parcast, or some licensing deals with the likes of Joe Rogan and the Obamas and the Kardashians recently. And we have our own studio team to create original content. So kind of taking the Netflix approach of creating our own content. Um, <clears throat> and then from the monetization side, which is my, my bag at Spotify, I can talk for hours on this, but we're building a new piece of technology called streaming ad insertion, which if anybody's interested to hear more of, then please one off me and we can chat more about that. But quite broadly, our goals are basically to kind of be the YouTube of audio. So we're looking to be that one dominant platform for all of the world's audio needs. And to finish up on the Spotify angle, I've got a, a nice little quote from this chap. Uh, hopefully many of you recognize him. He's one of those annoying people that's still in his mid thirties, but is a billionaire. So, uh, yeah, we can all be jealous about that. Um, but super smart guy, actually. This is Daniel Ek, the founder and CEO of Spotify. And I've picked out this quote that he spoke about in our push to become a global audio network, where consumers spend roughly the same amount of time consuming video on a daily basis as they do consuming audio. But video is about a trillion dollar marketplace. If you look at cinema, TV advertising, YouTube, streaming services it's around a million a, a trillion dollar market now compare that to the music and radio industry which is i say only <laughs> it's a lot of money still but still only worth a hundred billion dollars so the key question that he wants to address is why are our eyes considered to be worth 10 times more than it is there's a massive misbalance there and we as a company want to address that and want to make sure that the audio space has a lot more prominence and has a lot more value compared to the video space. So that's why we as a company are investing so heavily into this space and into podcasts in particular. 
Um, other than the fact that obviously the margins are better for podcast and music, but we won't go into that now. Cool. So hopefully you found that a little bit interesting. Um, the most interesting stuff is still to come. So we're going to kick off some of the Q&A with some of the guests. And I guess I'm going to go from one inspirational tech entrepreneur to another one and welcome in Steve Austins. <laughs> like that that Steve? Yeah, I'm loving it. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. So you got the guy, kind of the, 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 the guy who owns Spotify here and then, yeah. And, and then here you are in Bengal Media Towers, which is a, which is a, a, a kind of house in Grangetown in Cardiff. Good. So anyway, yeah, thanks Steve for, for joining us. So obviously you're going to talk about podcasting from a business development tool purposes. So mm. Steve, why don't you start off with just giving us a bit of an intro to who you are, who Bengal Media is, and maybe a bit about your background as well. Uh, yeah, well, um, Bengal Media started three years ago now. Um, I, my, myself and my wife run the company, uh, both of us with a, a background in, in radio, mine predominant, we, predominantly within uh, BBC and within BBC Wales. Um, I remember leaving um, uh, my, my old job. I, I used to run BBC Radio Wales for, for the last seven years of my time there. And when I was leaving, I had a conversation with the director of BBC Wales, uh, who kind of just asked the obvious question, which was, is there anything in this podcasting thing? You know, is it, are, are you making the right decision here? Um, and, you know, boldly, I said, yeah, absolutely, 100%. Uh, and then walked out of the room and thought, am I? I don't know. But the truth of the matter was that that actually what we were seeing from America and the early and the early um, days of podcasting here in the UK, um, I say early days. Obviously, podcasting has been going for about twenty years, kind of now, but actually, it still feels like a relatively new medium. Um, but that there was momentum and actually within the course of kind of six, nine months that then, then that took off. Um, and Bengo Media um, is is a company that, that works on branded podcasts, on business podcasts. So we work with companies to get their podcast uh, journey started, whether that be through making podcasts for them. Um, or whether that be through training uh, and consultation, basically. So we, it, it's kind of a mix. Kind of half of my life lives in in full on kind of podcast production, and half my life in in training in, and um, and and bringing those ideas through. Okay, cool. And uh, so I'm sure there's many business owners, whether it's a small business or a big business, on this call. So let's get straight into it then. So you know, why do you think a business should be creating a podcast? I think that, well, first of all, kind of as, as you, you talked about screen time there, Dylan, kind of, you know, it is the only way in which you're going to be able to reach your potential uh, clients while they're doing something else. Um, it is the, the medium by which you can kind of capture people while they're walking the dog, going to the gym. Remember the days where we could go to the gym, doing the ironing, whatever. But the point is, is that actually um, you have the ability to, to have a captive audience without them looking at a screen or kind of reading something. Um, it is um, a brilliant, brilliant medium for, um, for depth of relationship. It's one-on-one. 90% -on -one. of people who listen to podcasts are listening to them on their own. Seven in 10 of them are listening on their smartphones. So they've got their earbuds in, and it's, it's complete and utter me time. 65% of podcast listeners will listen to a podcast all the way through to its end. That's phenomenal. Um, that's phenomenal loyalty and phenomenal kind of um, uh, 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 it's a phenomenal way of kind of just demonstrating that somebody wants to kind of, you know, that they're bought into it. Nobody stumbles on a podcast they will take an active decision to listen to you. So it is a phenomenal kind of switched on lean forward medium. It's the home of niches as well. It is, it is the place where actually people will search out things that they are interested in. It's narrow casting, whereas radio is broadcasting. Um, and, and talking about the figures of kind of how many people are out there listening to podcasts now, 
that, that number keeps on rising. So there are lots more ears out there that could potentially come across your podcast. And that is a really f- um, fantastic, phenomenally exciting place to be at the moment. Good. So, uh, yeah, hopefully many people are now thinking, OK, I'm going to I'm going to do it. I'm going to create a podcast for my business. So what would kind of be the, the key do's and don'ts, do you think, that people should think about content wise? So the first uh, I think the first big don't, if you like, is it's it's not a selling medium. Don't go on there and kind of talk about kind of what offers you've got 30 percent off, et cetera, et cetera. You've got a website that can do that for you. You've got social media to do that for you. At the end of the day, if I am kind of taking the dog for a walk, I'm not going to listen to you selling to me for for half an hour. Um, That's that, you know, podcasts are about uh, about enjoyment or about education, companionship as, as kind of you talked about there, Dylan. So actually you have to tell stories and, and think broadly about what your company do. So for example, take uh, investment bank in America, Charles Schwab, um, do a podcast called Choiceology. It's about the choices we make as human beings and how to make better choices. Charles Schwab want you to make better choices about your financial management and ultimately kind of get you to to invest with them. But the podcast's not about that on the nose. It is exploring the idea about the choices we make as human beings. So think broadly when you're telling stories and be quite generous with that platform. Offer your expertise as well. As, as, you, as you say, it's an education medium. So actually, where's your thought leadership? What can you tell people that actually will make people lean in and think about what they want to do and uh it, so is there a best practice in terms of format you know you see many podcasts will release weekly you know twice a week um some of them will have seasons of maybe 12 to 15 some of them will have ongoing weekly is that kind of a general best practice from a brand's perspective for this I think the more you release, the, the, the more chance you have of building up um, um, a regular, large, loyal following. So actually, the, in an ideal world, you would kind of do it weekly, you do it multiple times a week and so on and so forth. The reality of, of businesses is that, you know, you are, you, you, you are providers of whatever product you make as opposed to content creators so actually there's an element of practicality about it my advice if you're starting off is to actually think about it as you'd think about a marketing campaign in terms of think about do i need to carve out an element of time here where we actually focus on recording content creating content editing that content and then actually kind of we've got six eight ten episodes ready to go whenever we're ready to release them the other thing about podcasting as well is that actually it's at its best when the content is evergreen when the content is something that is as relevant in 18 months time as it is as it is now so actually if you're if you're concentrating on creating that content that kind of content then actually you can record it in bulk and then go for it from from that point onwards um, in terms of format um, one-to-one interviews um, work round table discussions work as long as you're very focused on where that discussion is going um, the the gold standard the Amer- you know the american dream of kind of these things is creating these big epic feature um, um, programs and stuff like that, but really does suck up a lot of energy and time. So I think if you've got, if you've got a good one-to-one interview format, that's a really great place to start. Cool. Okay. So last one from you then, Steve, um, if somebody does want to do this, um, what kind of KPI should they be looking at? Because like you said, it is quite a niche thing. It's not about, I need tens of thousands of listeners. Like, so what kind of KPI should they be looking at? I think, I mean, the, the, in terms of branded podcasts, business podcasts, you don't see those towards the top of kind of the Spotify or kind of uh, Apple podcast charts. At best, those podcasts are going to get high four figure kind of numbers for, for episodes. The chances are they will get much less than that. But the way to think about it 
is not necessarily about chasing numbers. It's about what do you want this podcast to do for you? If it's about thought leadership or if it's about kind of brand awareness, how many leads would you like that podcast to create for you over the course of the year? Is there a way of getting from that podcast to your website and then kind of just converting from that point? Think about it this way. If you kind of have a podcast that has 50 listeners and you are kind of spend half an hour exploring an idea that's, that's absolutely core, fundamental to your company. If you've got 50 people who are listening to that, that's a really big breakfast meeting. If you've got a hundred people, then you are kind of really motoring. You are at, you, you're at a kind of an event like this kind of and talking to people. If you're at 500 people, then you're on, you're at TEDx, you know, so think about, you know, redefine the numbers, small numbers, small numbers in quotations in your head, and then think about what impact you can have by actually communicating your ideas to that many people. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Steve. I just realized I probably should have put your email address on here. So if anybody is interested to hear more about why you should be creating a podcast for your business or work with Bengo Media, then please do get in touch with Steve. Perhaps uh, Zara or Liz, we can put Steve and all the other people's email addresses, if that's allowed, uh, into the chat function so that uh, people can contact you. But thanks very much, Steve. And, and just so you're aware, the, the, the visual on the screen is uh, one of the podcasts that uh, Bengo Media created as well for Macmillan Cancer. Cool. So thank you, Steve. We're just going to uh, transition now and, and move across the pond to North America and talk about podcasting just from a personal perspective and uh, introduce Reese Waters, who's the owner of Podstarter. So Reese, welcome on here. And uh, first of all, how on earth does a chap from Blackwood end up in Halifax, Canada? <laughs> I'm still working it out. Um, <laughs> well, I, uh, I, me and my wife fancied a, a new challenge and our kids were young enough and we just really have always fancied trying life out in Canada. Uh, and Brexit happened and a few other things happened in our lives and we were like, this is the time to do it. And we've been in Nova Scotia now for like two years. So yeah, it's, uh, it's surreal. But we've, we've, the weird thing is we keep bumping into Welsh people here, which seems to be a, a common thing, I think. <laughs> Fantastic. Good. So um, give us a bit about your background then. So I know you worked uh, in the podcast or audio space back in Wales uh, before heading out to Canada. So talk us through a bit that and, and then obviously go on to your own company now out in, uh, in Canada. Yeah, so I, I started out in my early 20s as a producer and director uh, for, for BBC TV. Um, I worked on a show called Rod Gilbert's Work Experience from like series one to eight. And then in about 2015, I uh, started to do more radio comedy. Um, and uh, Steve, when he was still in uh, Radio Wales, uh, gave us an opportunity to make a comedy show called The Unexplainers, which was my first real uh, stab at making something for podcasting and it, it did really well and we had a really kind of loving loyal audience and this was still before podcast audiences had taken off in this way but it was still um substantial in, in terms of uh, the the feedback and the engagement we had from people uh so i kind of uh, found that as a as a as a new kind of passion and 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 how to tell stories in a different way from tv was a really kind of thing cool thing to get into so uh when i when i moved then to canada i was going around selling myself as a freelance producer of, of video production and video content but the minute i started talking about podcasting in any meetings with people uh their eyes would light up and suddenly we just would completely stop talking about video and we would just be talking about podcasts what shows they like what they've listened to sharing recommendations and it seemed like such a such a uh, missed opportunity to not really pivot into having a business about uh, podcast creation so uh, I set up uh, with a gentleman called Jonathan Burns, who's uh, who's from here, um, a company called Podstarter. And essentially, we, we're very similar to, to, to Bengo in a sense. We create brand, branded podcasts for companies in in, uh, in Canada, but we're also starting to branch out into um, original content with um, sponsorship from brands. And also um, Canadian Politics is Boring is a, is a kind of a self-funded comedy project that we, we kind of launched uh, on the side as well. Um, and we, we, we mainly help uh, brands 
uh, kind of accelerate their production process with podcasting. So they, they skip the amateur um, era of, I'm going to buy a microphone. How does it work? How do I get this on the internet? And we try and get them to that early, uh, to that polished stage of creating a well-formed uh, show uh, much faster in that sense. Cool. And I believe that Canadian politics is boring is uh, climbing the ranks very nicely, isn't it? Yeah. So we launched like three or four months ago and we found a, a niche. We found a, a gap in the market, which was, um, there seems to be very little political satire in Canada, unlike the UK and the US where there's a lot of it going on. And Canadians keep telling me it's because their politics is boring. Um, but the, when I looked into it, I, I kind of felt there were some really interesting stories to be explored and that no one was really talking about them in this kind of comedic style. So that's why we kind of launched it. Um, and since since we have launched it, it's, it's grown faster than we ever expected it to. Um, we got a number eight in comedy in, in Canada in the Apple charts, and we've now signed up with um, Frequency Podcast. You can see they, they've added their logo to the top of our artwork. Um, we're doing a relaunch and a rebrand with them, and they're part of um, the Rogers Media Group. So they own 60 radio stations across Canada, and they have a few TV channels as well. So um, we're part of the merging between podcasting and radio that's going on in Canada at the moment. So um, when the show gets relaunched in September, um, it'll be featuring on some of the radio stations, for instance, as well, where they're trying to cross-pollinate those audiences. Great stuff. And that's awesome to see a success story like that. Um, so I'm sure there's plenty of people on this call who are thinking, you know, yeah, maybe they've done a podcast themselves or they're thinking of creating a podcast themselves, not necessarily from a business perspective, but just from a passion point perspective. So what kind of advice would you give these people, both from a, an approach and a, what tech to use, programs to use, equipment, you know, I don't, don't need to go into too much depth here, but um, give some sort of key tips to some people who are thinking of doing it. I think the, the key thing for me is always, why are you doing this? What is your reason for being sat in front of a microphone talking? Because um, often people say, I want a podcast, and they justify having a podcast and try and think of reasons to kind of uh, things to talk about and a format they can use. But ultimately, the, the like a show like Canadian Politics is boring. I, I have a hunger to learn about the politics of Canada and to compare it to the politics I grew up with in the UK. And... Uh, and, and that is the passion that drives my energy to make that show. And I, I, I think that, you know, if you have a passion for what you talk about and you have a genuine interest uh, and an insight to share, that is the key thing. Uh, and you'll find that with a lot of smaller podcasts that then grow bigger audiences is that the, the hosts are uh, just tend to have something in them for that topic that attracts people to it. Uh, and I, I think that the things like the tech and uh, uh, and you know anchor for instance you know uh, you, you can you can literally just get started with just your phone and anchor on your phone if you wanted to uh, and I, th I think for people who are just starting out they, they should definitely just start recording themselves talking and having conversations even if they never release them just to get the right chemistry and get the right mood and tone just to find out what they sound like and to share with people they trust just to get a really good idea of of uh, what they sound like and, and if it's worth pushing further, I suppose. It's always very cringy the first time you hear your own voice, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But, exactly. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely echo the, the, the practice side of things. Um, so then um, we just discussed before uh, we opened up to the rest of the call that you've been quite creative in the locations that you've been recording in. And uh, talk us through some of the sort of not inventions but your creativity <laughs> in recording locations so yeah I, I mean with with the unexplainers we used to we never used to do any studio recording it was always in a car or hanging off the side of a mountain uh and i i when i came to canada i bought uh, an old buick say not old enough to be cool but old enough for me to be able to to buy one <laughs> and the uh, the buick the uh they were designed to be uh insulated to be really quiet so what i did was i built a podcast studio on the back seat um, and then I've, I've been testing out in different places like parking it next to busy roads and things like that um, um, we've done a YouTube video about like the, the testing process so uh, I, I'm, I like kind of experimenting with interesting places where you can uh, you know record audio and also how you can use microphones in different ways and, and just be playful with it. 
awesome. It's good to see. I do find your um, LinkedIn posts quite entertaining on that front. So, uh, <laughs> for those of you that haven't connected with Reese, then please do so. Um, and again, we'll put uh, Reese's details um, in the chat so that if you want to contact him separately. Uh, nice one. Thanks very much, Reese, for that. Um, so we're now going to move on to Siren from the BBC, who we're going to talk about how podcasts are changing the media landscape. So Siren, welcome, Croiso, to uh, the Zoom call. Do you want to give a bit of an introduction to yourself as a starting point? Yeah, sure. Dioch. Um, so my name is Siren Jones. I've been working in podcasts now for just under two years at the BBC. Um, I started with um, the BBC's first daily news podcast, uh, known as Beyond Today. Um, but from March, the BBC decided to open a new um, a news po podcast unit. Um, with the intention of having four different podcasts and journalists working and rotating across across all four podcasts. Uh, what we didn't anticipate was launching during the global pandemic. So what happened was we had to suspend three of our podcasts and we basically put all of our man and woman power and effort into uh, what is now known as Newscast. It was formerly known as Brexit Cast and it's, it was temporarily uh, over COVID, the coronavirus newscast. So every day we were just pumping out um, content and news to do with coronavirus. Um, so there's the coronavirus newscast, which as of this week has been rebranded again as just the regular newscast. So that's our daily news podcast. We've also relaunched the next episode, which is a weekly uh, podcast targeting 16, 24 year olds from underserved communities. Um, we've also relaunched AmeriCast, which is our podcast revolving around the US elections. And there's one more podcast to relaunch, which is Beyond Today, which is going to come back as a new news features podcast, which will be going about twice a week. So my day-to-day -day job kind of involves producing the audio, editing, reporting, seeking original journalism for the news teams. Um, and yeah, I mean, we serve uh, an array of different audiences. And I think working on, every working on every podcast is serving a different audience and no job is the same, really. So that's kind of where I am now. Cool. So I, I know you're kind of primarily a podcast producer, but I guess you would classify yourself as a journalist uh, as well. Um, how, how do you think that sort of podcasting has changed um, the, the traditional journalism trade? I think podcasts has changed journalism by giving journalists permission to kind of pump the brakes on the news agenda. Um, as most people know, journalists are slaves to the news agenda. We have to keep up with that constant deadline, the churning of the news, the churning of the output. And podcasts give us the time to kind of breathe, firstly. And because of the longer um, time slots that podcasts usually are, um, they give us the time to think, to be quite simply. So, um, you know, we get to consider which people we want to have onto our podcast. And we get to, we get to have them on knowing that we can have them on for more than just 30 seconds to 90 seconds, like your regular news program. We get to really take the, the time to delve into discussions, to delve into topics, challenge audiences' assumptions. Um, it's a brilliant way to be more proactive with our journalism as well, rather than reactive. Um, it's, you know, with news, you're constantly reacting to that news agenda. But with podcasts, you do get to take the time to go out into communities, actually speak to people, and to revolve the news around the person rather than having the person revolve around the news line. Um, and yeah, the more time you have, again, you know, the more people you can speak to, the more time you can give them on air. Um, and I mean, these daily podcasts do exist, such as newscasts, but you know, then when they do exist, they do tend to struggle with our identity and they tend to struggle with kind of sound, sounding different to the mainstream radio programs that already exist and already kind of dominate that space. Yeah, it makes sense. And you mentioned then that the, you know, the BBC are creating a huge amount of podcasts. And I mentioned earlier how, you know, how great BBC sounds is as a platform. Um, so can you kind of sum up why, why are BBC investing so heavily into the podcast world? Yeah, so I think, you, you know, I don't work on the BBC Sounds team, just to clarify. So I work with the podcast and BBC Sounds have their own team and, you know, they've got all their commissioning and they've got their pot of money, which they decide what they want to do with. But from my, experiencing, from my experience in working and producing podcasts, we know that podcasts skew younger um, and younger audiences has been a demographic at the BBC specifically. And actually not just the BBC, I think all different media outlets, including, you know, ITV, 
Channel 4, etc. Younger audiences of that demographic, but everybody at the moment is trying to engage. Everybody is having a meltdown and trying to figure out how do we keep our news outlets relevant for the next generation. Um, and we know that podcasts are doing well, and I believe that's one of the reasons why the BBC has set up BBC Sounds. It only launched just over a year ago and decided to put money, in, money into podcasts and audio. Um, just today, I believe BBC Children in Need have said that they're matching Stormzy's £10 million pledge to benefit young black lives in the UK. And that's on top of uh, the £100 million investment that the BBC has already said that they're going to invest in diverse content. So there's been talk about some of this pledge and some of this money going into radio and audio, including uh, Radio One Extra, which is a predominantly black uh, radio platform station uh, for young black Brits. So it's going to be quite interesting to see where this money is going to go and how much of it will actually go to those younger audiences that we're really trying to, I guess, a lot of people would say win back. But I would say, you know, I don't, I don't quite think we were there in the first place. I think the BBC for the first time has competition, uh, which is very good, but it does drive a few editors to have breakdowns, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, we've got some competition. As kind of what you said before, Delan, you know, young people, we love to listen to stuff on YouTube. We love to spend time on YouTube. Um, there are different platforms that are kind of competing for our attention. Um, so BBC Sounds is really trying to invest in, in the audio world there at the moment. Um, yeah. Yeah, that makes total sense. So um, looking ahead to the future then, you know, you just mentioned that podcasting is great for younger, more diverse audiences. And we've shown earlier, you know, the, the, the classic trend of people moving away from broadcast linear content into the more on-demand world. Um, as a journalist, you know, do you see significant changes in the way that you'll be working in the future? This is the one question where I really have to think because I, the honest answer is I'm not sure. We know that, you know, frequency in podcasts and the retention rates in podcasts are, you know, are brilliant. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, radio definitely is in danger and, you know, it, it is shrinking and it does kind of skew towards older listeners, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to die anytime soon, I don't think. You know, Radio 2, for example, is still the leading radio station in the country and, uh, the, the statistic here that says um, in the UK it saw its average consumer listen to over 10 hours of Radio 2 per week. You know, they still have that companionship for their listeners. They still have the entertainment, they've got the news, they've got the sports. Um, and it's still, for now, it's still going strong. Um, but I do think that radio does need to kind of adjust and change with the time, especially as the audiences kind of grow, grow, grow older, basically. Um, I think listeners are very aware that there are so many, if not too many podcasts that are available at the moment. It's so hard to um, decide what you want to listen to. And, you know, it's already, it's already been mentioned in the chat, but you know, there's just so much choice and you don't really stumble upon a podcast. You have to make that decisive decision. But when you've got, you know, every single niche is already taken. Um, it can be quite difficult to figure out what do you want to listen to. And for us as journalists, it can be quite difficult to figure out what are we going to make next. Um, and it's not just the competition we have from other journalists. It's competition from non-journalists, from people who, you know, like probably when many people in this group who are sat there thinking, I'm going to start my own podcast, or people who have already done so and have done fantastic jobs. So I think when it comes to what we need to change and how I see the media landscape shifting, I think we the BBC needs to do a better job of making sure that everything is covered. I think, we, I think we've nailed acquiring podcasts. I think we've nailed the whole celebrity chat. You know, you can buy celebs and when you buy celebs, you buy their followers and you buy their, you buy their listening figures. Um, but when it comes to different voices and when it comes to people who haven't been discovered yet, but those who kind of are very homegrown, like the receipts girls who, started a podcast, four girls from London started a podcast in their living room, drinking wine. Three years later, they went from the BBC to uh, acquired by Spotify. And, you know, now they're, as you probably know, Dylan, doing really, really well. Um, I think the BBC needs to do a better job of actually finding these people first and actually developing that talent instead of depending on those big names to kind of come forward. And um, I guess it's a slightly easier way of doing well in terms of Hitting those, hitting those numbers for that target audience. 
Yeah, no, that's uh, well said. And, and I agree with you on the whole quality versus quantity. You know, there's over a million podcasts out there already today. So, um, you know, the, the, definitely the, the world doesn't need more of the generically the same podcast, but, um, you know, if someone can create a good quality with a bit of def- differentiation, then there's definitely space for that. Um, so, Sarah, uh, thanks very much for that. And uh, we might come back to you in the questions later on. So, um, that Thank brings you. me on to the next person, which is Steph Guerrero, fresh from his car outside a Cardiff street. Um, <laughs> hey, Steph, welcome. So give us a bit of background as to Nata Media and, and also to, let's talk about the socially distanced sports bar. It's a massive hit, which hopefully a lot of you on this call uh, already listen to. <laughs> it's, yeah, so my background is 20 years at the BBC, um, kind of hitting some of the frustrations that Sarah was talking about, um, working you know in collaboration with Steve an awful lot of the time uh, during my career as well. He's given me an awful lot of breaks down the years, so... It's, it's nice to see familiar faces on this call. I think all of you guys I've worked with and all of you have helped me out in various ways. So uh, it's nice to kind of be among familiar and nice faces. So Nata Media, we set up in January when I left the BBC. Um, I've joined Cardiff Met University as a, a lecturer in sports media, um, working on the sports broadcast postgraduate course as well, and kind of decided to have a little sideline business going as well just to see how much stress i could handle uh during a global pandemic um so we thought what can we do that might be a bit different that might not be what the regular sports podcast is um and we most sports podcasts are a little bit too serious they're a little bit too i don't know they take themselves too seriously and are too newsy if you like. No conversation you ever have with your mates in the pub about sport is reflected really in the podcast world at the moment. So we just decided to have a go at it ourselves. So it was probably the day that Boris Johnson announced lockdown. Myself, Mike Bubbins and Alice James sent a couple of texts to each other. And that was the start point, really. There, There was no more thought that went into it than that. And we just worked out a format from there. Awesome. I, I know it's called a socially distant sports bar, but purely the fact that you were socially distant, that must have posed some logistical problems. Uh, yes and no, I would say. I think uh, I've spent most of my career trying to get people into the same space, into a studio. You know, we can't do that. Oh, they're going to dial in. It's going to be a pain. But doing this has kind of taught me that, do you know what? It's actually a lot easier to edit. The, the, the sort of fundamentals of things where you've got people recording their own audio in a separate place. It's a dream, to be honest with you. If it works, you've got no one talking over each other. You can no bleed through from microphones on a really geeky level. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, you can get away with an awful lot more. Um, are, 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 they, are they all kitted out individually? Like, are you I, all I mean, that, that was a stress. You, you've got two guys who I work with who I think would admit aren't the most tech-savvy people in the world. <laughs> So there are a lot of fun conversations. Thankfully, Alice was working with Five Live. So the guys who work with him, Dave, who produces him, went through much more hard work than I did to get him up to a point where he was recording stuff uh, in quality on his computer. Uh, Mike is, I think, you know, Reese has worked with Mike down the years on uh, The Unexplainers. Mike is not a technical man. He's from the 70s. Um, so, <laughs> and that's not an act. So it, it is very, he's been brilliant in fairness. He's kind of learned how to do it all. Recording on your computer is really simple with a really simple cheap. The mic I'm using costs about 30 quid. It's, it's, it is really easy to do, but you do need the tech knowledge to be able to do the editing and so on. So I, I think a lot of people want to get into the marketplace and want to get involved. So the actual recording of stuff, you can do really well or you can do really badly with cheap or really expensive equipment and so, so do you do that via zoom do you all get together on a bit of yes a it's just like this yeah just like this on a zoom call but we all record our audio in our houses separately so we all go on the quick time on our macbooks or whatever it is we've got i know a lot of people do it on their phones as well we just record the audio separately i then have about three quarters of an hour of stress on a sunday night where the files don't land in my inbox and i think that one of them's messed it up um so i kind of record the zoom call as a backup 
Um, but it, it, it all, it all has worked so far. I know, I know panic. That's a about. jinx. That's a jinx. It is, yeah. So, so next week, come Tuesday morning, the episode won't be there because Arla forgotten to record it or something. But it, it, it all comes in. It's all great. And like I say, all the audio tracks are separate. Sync them all up, and then the editing is, as I'm sure Steve will agree, the fun part of life. <laughs> and uh, th- there must be quite a lot of prep involved because you seem to be either reading books or watching documentaries, or is this all fake? Give us a <laughs> so I never do any project that I can't fit into at least two parts of my life anyway. So I was already working on a module for the undergrad course at Cardiff Met, which was um, culture, media and sport. So I was working on that during January and February. And that involves sort of the crossover between sport and music and uh, cinema and literature, uh, fashion to a certain extent as well. So it kind of all interlinks in my life anyway. So I'm reading all these books anyway, watching an awful lot of sports documentaries as it was. So it's been no added pressure on my life. I think Mike does that sort of thing anyway. I think for Alice, he's probably the busiest out of the three of us. He's been more busy during lockdown than uh, lockdown than, than anybody else because uh, Five Live have got him doing an awful lot more podcasts i think contractually had to do them anyway but i, th- I think uh they, they were behind on their their payments for five live alice and john so they had to do an awful lot more work anyway but if, yeah it it does involve a bit of work it doesn't involve a lot of conversation pre-recording because i think we decided early on that we didn't want to have those you, you know when you chat to your mates about something and then if you imagine trying to replicate that conversation as a yeah. podcast we decided quite early on that that wasn't going to work so our whatsapp group is quite dull to be honest it's quite it's quite a muted sort of thing because if we're all watching the same documentary that week you don't want to have that text conversation where you sort of let all your feelings about something out you just go oh it's great or no that was rubbish but apart from that we don't go too far in depth before because yeah you want you want it to be not yeah you want to be natural you want to be organic and so, yeah. some of the utter nonsense that mike comes out with i guess you, you want to hear for the first time during the podcast <laughs> I, sometimes i don't want to hear it at all uh, <laughs> and sometimes even when i'm hearing it i'm trying to work out whether we're going to play it or not yeah. um it, it, it's changed a lot i think if it was in the hands so format wise we watch um six youtube clips i choose two alice chooses two Mike chooses two, and then one of us will choose a documentary, and then we just talk about each other's stuff. And I think the first episode probably stuck to that format more rigidly than the rest of them. But as I say, y- your conversations don't go in the direction that they should go anyway in life. So why would you stick to a rigid format? I think my, my sort of 20 years in radio disappearing off on tangents with really frustrated producers, the other side of a glass has kind of taught me sometimes you just go with your feelings sometimes you just go with a conversation anyway and that's more real yeah and that's the beauty of the on-demand nature of podcasting in that if it's an hour and 23 minutes that's absolutely fine doesn't have to be cut off uh, at the hour mark absolutely they're getting longer as well that's the the worry (laughs) um (laughs) and the records get into four hours of length um but that, that is the thing isn't it so you know, you guys have just signed up Joe Rogan. His podcasts aren't short. Um, I'm not saying that everyone's podcast should be an hour and 40 minutes. I think you've got to totally judge it on merit. But that's the advantage of the on-demand industry, whether it's Netflix or, you know, the audio side of things. I don't really care how long an episode. I often don't look. You know, if I'm listening to, I don't know, Scroobius Pip or I'm listening to Richard Herring. I'm not looking at the length of it before I press play. I'm looking at who they're interviewing and whether I want to listen to it or not. Yeah. Um, so there's a question come through that actually you uh, might be able to answer, uh, Steph. So it's about the the Welsh podcasting scene. So, you know, is there much of a, a you know, obviously we've got lots of successful Welsh people on the call here from the podcast world, but is there much of a Welsh podcasting scene? And someone specifically has asked for, you know, a distributor for Welsh produced podcasts. I, I know that there's a Welsh language distributor, and I don't know if Aled Jones is on the call here, but if not, I think he is, um, yeah. I think I saw his uh, name coming is. up okay. earlier, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, may, maybe, um, Steph, you just chat about the, the scene in Wales, then maybe we can uh, get Aled on to talk about the Welsh language podcast scene. I think traditionally 
people lent on the BBC and if it didn't get commissioned there, they got either despondent or assumed it wasn't a good idea in the first place and then perhaps shelved it. And I don't think that any room of commissioners, I've, I've been in the position of commissioning stuff or not commissioning it in the past and I've got things wrong. And I think that commissioners do get things wrong. That's just the nature of opinion in life. Yeah. Just because, you know, the Beatles got turned down by someone, they were wrong. It's, it's, it's a really simplistic kind of thing to go, right, okay, somebody's turned down my idea, my idea is terrible. It's not, it might be, but it, it, it may well not be. Um, so with this particular product, we decided you can do it on your own. You might not make money. You've got to be able to take a hit because you're not going to make money out of it maybe ever, but it might be a loss leader for something else. So I'm working with two, well, one guy who's a stand-up comedian, one guy who does, you know, comedy stuff in Welsh and an awful lot of other work as well. This could then lead, if you've got 20,000 people listening to a product, that could lead to something else for you. So that might be something where you take a hit in terms of the finances of it. But I think the democratization of, that's the best thing about podcasting is, you know, you guys... Uh, Spotify moving into the hosting side of things. You, you look at Audio Boom. We're with DAX now, which is the the global business. Um, so they got you know Radio X, LBC, those sort of networks. So we're with them in terms of sorting out our advertising and our and our hosting as well. But it's quite easy. Just jump on Buzzsprout or or whatever it is. Look up the websites and have a look at it. And you can get your product out there really really easily. You know, I noticed Rod Gilbert's podcast doing exceptionally well at the moment i think people have noticed during this period now if i do commit a bit of time to this then i can make the product myself and that might not mean the finances that working for the bbc would mean or working for any big company uh you know you guys commission stuff directly at spotify as well but it also means that you're your own boss and you make your own decisions so you've got to balance those things up yeah. in life yeah makes sense um, so, Aled, not, not sure if you're on the call, and I don't mean to drop you in it, but um, you, I'll give you a bit of five seconds of silence to see if you want to jump in and talk about the Welsh language podcast scene and what you've got set up. Or did, did you know, Aled? I do, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so I've, I've developed um, a pod, which is a, a Welsh language service, um, primarily aimed at bringing together all Welsh language podcasts out there. Um, so it was kind of born out of a frustration, really, that the kind of big podcast players didn't know how to deal with minority languages. There's only a set, certain amount of languages they can kind of cope with. Um, and I found that I wasn't able to browse um, podcasts in, in my kind of native language. So that's why I kind of went and, and set up a pod. And the kind of the boom in the Welsh language podcast um, scene has been massive in the last year. Um, so, so the numbers have grown from 38 podcasts in the Welsh language to uh, 105 currently, and there's been a massive growth um, during COVID as well. With, a, with you know, kind of lots, kind of um, publishing on Anchor as well, really. So, yeah, it's it's, it's a really good project, and I'm, and I'm looking to do something similar with other minority languages in the future as well. Now, what's the me? Diolch, Diolch, Aled. Sorry, I'm dropping you in on that. Great. Um, <laughs> Okay, so we're just going to go to a couple of the questions which I, I've seen come through. So there's one from Ram, which talks about how do you monetize podcasts? Well, I guess um, there's two, well, there's a couple of different models. The main one is through advertising. So you get a brand to sponsor the podcast. Either you can get a brand to sponsor the entire series of a podcast, or you can get what's known as a host read where, you know, you see if you listen to uh, Steph's socially distant sports bar, you know, they have beer 52 as a sponsor and they will read out the beer 52 ad in a very native style that's native to the content of the show and to their personalities as hosts. So that's the primary monetization vehicle. There are other um, angles where there's some subscription services like Patreon, which you can work with, where essentially if you have a loyal audience, they can pay a monthly fee, whether it's four quid a month, five quid a month, and they get something in return, whether that's exclusive content or direct access to the hosts or various other things. Um, so that's often quite a, a good way of tapping into a loyal audience who's willing to, to pay for the service and the content they are getting. 
Um, and then if, I guess if you're really popular and successful, then there's the, the live space, which is really pick, kicking off from a podcast perspective as well. So, um, but really it's the advertising side is the, is the main way for monetizing on the podcast space. Um, what else have we got here? Um, what advice would you give for someone looking to go into the freelance podcast production? So that's come from Caitlin. Um, I can't remember who mentioned it now, but somebody mentioned earlier about being a freelancer. I think it was, it was Reese. Um, but in my experience, you know, we, we work with a lot of producers for our original programming at Spotify. And I'm also now thinking of my future venture. Um, it seems that the majority of the producer community are freelancers. Um, it seems that the audio world of freelancers and without a shadow of a doubt, and I think this call has, has confirmed that they've all worked for five live or BBC. I think that that's the conclusion I've come to over the last couple of months that every single audio producer in the whole world has worked for five live or the BBC in some way. And I think our, our four guests today have confirmed that. So um, Reese, Steve uh, or Steph, I, I don't know if you guys want to jump in with any other kind of advice for a freelance producer. I know the services like Fiverr, which is a marketplace for freelancers, but feel free to jump in if you have any comments or advice. Yeah, I think like you do get a lot of people offering online editing services, but in terms of getting someone to be the talent to bring all the production together, um, I think the reason you get a lot of people from the BBC is that there's very similar element, elements to, to radio production and kind of TV production in terms of pulling those things together. So I think it would help to try um, having just general production experience or um, being uh, at this stage, there's not such a big podcast industry that you, you can necessarily find consistent podcast producing work unless you're in like a major hub city, like, like London or New York or whatever. So I think that um, the, the wire working and, and building up a remote uh, work uh, building up a remote client base would take a lot of time. Um, sometimes it's, it's a matter of being near where the production is happening and, and getting as much experience from there as possible. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, I think that, that producing is a, is, a, is a weird juggling act between somebody who's able to, to write, someone who is a brilliant organizer of multiple different plates spinning at the same time and at the end of it someone who can edit um, and you know if you can get a decent balance of those three skills then it's a buyer's market at the moment the amount of podcasts that are coming along people need producers uh, to actually kind of pull these things together. So actually, you know, there, there is a demand. And, and certainly here in Wales, I, I work a lot with the uh, public sector companies in, in, in Wales, and there is obviously a requirement to do those podcasts in both English and Welsh. So here in Wales, there is a, there's a real demand for, for, for producers uh, who can produce in both English and Welsh. Well, thanks, guys, for that. We've got one more question here before we cut off. So uh, any recommendations on tech or software to create a podcast where that comes from Jim Wall? Uh, on the software side or the hosting platform, um, we've mentioned Anchor already as probably the easiest to market, although not the most sophisticated. Um, then, you know, you've got the top end of the scale. You've got companies like Megaphone and Spreaker and Libsyn who at the top end and then in the middle there's lots of new companies who have arisen from like buzzsprout and podbean and captivate um there's probably about 10 or 12 maybe a bit more uh, hosting platforms in my opinion they're much of a muchness really um some of them have more sophisticated you know dynamic ad insertion capabilities if you want to go down that route in, on a scalable level but not many would um, but I'm sure if you're looking to do one um, for a business perspective, then I'm sure that Steve can, can advise personally and what's best to suit your needs. Um, and then from a tech perspective, yeah, like one of the guys said, you know, you don't need the most expensive equipment in the world, providing you've got the right environment and a good, decent microphone, then that should be good enough. Um, but really, if you if you want some specific advice on what's right for you, then please get in touch with uh, probably either Steve or Reese initially, and uh, I'm sure those guys will be able to help you out. Cool, okay, unless anybody's got another burning question they want to jump in with in the next five seconds, we will wrap up.
Okay, I'll take that as a no. So I'm going to leave my destination here in front of Castell Carrochenen out in the open with my 4G is good out in the countryside. Um, for those of you who would have guessed it, yes, that is indeed Castell Carrochenen, which is the local castle to my hometown in Ammonford. Um, so big thanks to you know Steph, Sarah, and Reese and Steve for joining. Big thanks to Wales Tech Week and Liz, who's on the call for arranging this week. Um, if you can get to any of the other events during the week, then please do so. Like I said, there's a lot of events going on showcasing the vast talent that Wales has in the tech space. Uh, and also big thanks to Global Welsh for putting this uh, Academy event on. Um, Global Welsh hosts regular events. So for those of you who haven't joined the community yet, please do so. Um, like I said, the, the, the best place to go to is connect.globalwelsh.com or follow them on social media. And yeah, there's lots of similar events to this that you can get, get along to. Um, so with that, we'll say a last thank you to everybody for coming along. And um, if you ha want anybody's uh, details from this, then please, yeah, contact Global Welsh on Twitter and we can go from there. So thanks all. I hope to see you all again. Thanks, everyone.